Thank you for joining us today and welcome as we are going to be hearing what Nick has to say um, in regards to his thesis topic. Uh, Nick has been my senior assistant this year for American history, and it's been really, really a blast having him. Um, he's so excited about history, the subject, and I would say his passion in history rivals that of my own, as well as Mr. Schumann's, which if you know anything about either of us, we really care about history. So that that definitely says a lot about Nick. Um, as many of you are aware, with the senior orals this year, we have added a couple of modifications, the first of which is, as the senior is presenting their topic and um, going through the, uh, the question panel time, you are allowed to and free to leave some comments for the senior and really give them some words of encouragement along the way. And the second feature is as we're nearing the second round of questions, um, we would like to invite you to go ahead and let us know, give us a couple of questions of your own that we can ask Nick and uh, hear what his insight is on that. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and open us in prayer and then Nick will present. Dearly Father, I thank for this day and uh, I thank you for my senior assistant, Nick. I thank you for his passion uh, for history and his passion for the subject that he's going to be presenting today. And I pray that you will just calm his nerves and I pray that you'll just give him the, you know, the words to speak and the inspiration to, you know, say the things that need to be said. And I pray that, you know, this will be a great time and that um, we'll just really be able to gain some insight into Nick's topic. In Christ's name, I pray and ask it all. Amen. What is a man? Is he the one who walks into the room with all the confidence and bravado of an action hero? Or is he the silent, strong man who brings down the hammer when your mom is mad? Is he the kind of guy who works nine to five to provide for his family? Or is he the one who comes in after dark, covered in motor oil, after working on his motorcycle all day? The truth is, a real man is both hard to find and hard to define. Uh, nowadays, the word masculinity is almost synonymous with arrogance and domineering. You are more likely to hear the term toxic masculinity than you are to hear masculinity alone. This begs the question, what characteristics makes masculinity toxic? Some say they vary from domestic violence to uh, spreading your legs a little bit too far on the bus. If this is the case, is manliness to blame or does it lie on the individuals themselves? Do a few bad men give all of us a bad reputation? This is, issue is very relevant in today's America. And in this thesis, I will attempt to persuade you that there is no such thing as toxic masculinity, and there never has been, that there are only toxic people who do toxic things. Let me begin by defining toxic masculinity for you. Toxic masculinity is referred to as the stoic, domineering, or otherwise dysfunctional attributes of man. For the purpose of this thesis, I will use the definition, the attributes of man that are solely focused on power and domination. This definition was provided to me by Mr. Kevin Sparks. Mr. Sparks is a deeply religious man and father of four who I had the pleasure of interviewing for my thesis. He has proven to be a great example of masculinity for me. Mr. Sparks shared with me some of the causes of this toxic masculinity idea. Radi the growing culture of feminism and social justice has over time shifted from the idea that of equality from the sexes to the idea that past oppression must be paid for. If in the modern feminist minds, all men are historical oppressors, then logically retribution must be paid. Not by bringing the oppressed up, by bringing the past oppressors low. While feminist rhetoric has obviously affected the way girls are brought up, it has definitely affected the way young boys are brought up. Young boys have been told from very young age it is not okay to be a male or to be white or specifically to be a white male. You are told from a very young age that you are privileged to be born with your skin color or your gender. 
An article in Psychology Today states that there has been a relentless ideological attack on masculinity stemming from radical feminism. The most recent example of this is the bogus term toxic masculinity. It seeks literally to pathologize the pathologize masculinity in ways that are profoundly harmful to the existential sense of self in a young man. One needs only to look up the terms male privilege or white privilege to understand that there are countless of sources telling you why you are lucky to be born male or white. The concept of men that are today in are, sorry, the concept that men are privileged in today's society goes against all uh, statistical data gleaned in recent years. As of 2017, 19.7 million young men are being raised in the home without a father. That's more than every one in four cases. Additionally, men are 3.53 times more likely to commit suicide than women are. And overall, white males account for seven out of every 10 suicides in the United States. These statistics were given to me by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, which is a nonpartisan uh, foundation to raise awareness for suicide and mental health. These statistics reflect a shift in American culture that's been happening over the last 50 years. Now, before I continue, I need to say this is not my attempt to attack or belittle women at all, or to minimize a mother's role in the household. I fully recognize that many amazing men have been raised by really amazing moms. On the contrary, it's my desire to put forth what real manliness is and how it can be helpful in the family dynamic. If toxic masculinity is the characteristics of men that are inherently focused on power and domination, then I believe this is a result of many things and that there are only toxic people who do toxic things. Invisible dads are an increasingly common phenomenon in today's society. According to a 2018 study by the Pew Research Center, most children that are being raised in an unmarried household are being raised by a single mother. That means about one in every five kids or 21% are being raised without a dad. That's an increase from 12% that was recorded in 1960. In earliest times, a man would have been essential for protection and providing. Aside from this, as our modern, modern society moves farther and farther away from subsistence-based living like hunting and farming to an urban family dynamic with Walmart and HEB, men, young men and women are being increasingly sheltered from the realities of life and life's responsibilities. This causes boys to be completely and totally inexperienced in areas of life that will be second nature to their fathers or grandfathers. These experiences can be hunting, fishing, hiking, or even less conventionally manly things like holding down a job or helping with chores around the house. This lack of experience manifests itself into a total lack of confidence in young men and results in either overly aggressive or overly submissive tendencies in developing boys. The direction that the young man goes depends solely on his own particular experiences and personality. Many additional problems are caused by the aforementioned lack of fathers in the home. Even some children who have fathers in the home still suffer on account of their father being complacent or absent in their raising. These fathers are referred to as invisible dads, where they are physically present in their child's life but take no active role in helping them develop. They leave the majority of that work to the matriarch of the household, which lends itself to other problems. Robert Lewis describes this father in his work, Raising a Modern Day Knight. He states, invisible dads are toxic to their sons. I know because I've counseled many of them. Invisible dads are busy, rushed, and full of good intentions. Their stories and circumstances vary wildly. But the crippling impact of their lives upon their sons is the same, a disfigured masculinity with disastrous results. Boys raised by this kind of father typically choose one of two paths. The first path leads to the boy's complete and total rejection of masculinity and its dominant force in a relationship between a man and a woman. This creates a docile and tame man who takes a back seat in every leadership role and never speaks his mind, especially towards women. This sensitivity can also be a byproduct of being raised by a solo mom. Invisible dads tend to force mothers to be domineering and authoritative instead of enjoying their natural, loving, and compassionate role they deserve as the mother. This happens when moms feel as though they need to step up as both the disciplinary and the nurturer because the father is completely absent. Unfortunately, the family balance between the dominant masculine side and the merciful feminine side almost completely disappears as the mom has to accept the dominant masculine side in order to keep order in the house. 
The result of this is that sons feel completely and totally emasculated by their mothers and develop an irrational fear of angering them. This behavior transfers into life after they leave home. These men become very self-conscious men who allow the women in their lives to dominate them and further emasculate them into submission. These men tend to also become that. This behavior transfers into life after they leave home. These men become very self-conscious men who allow the women in their lives to further dominate and emasculate them in submission. These men also tend to become invisible dads because of their fathers and their irrational fear of angering their wife. Hence, the cycle repeats itself. All that, of course, is dependent whether or not these men maintain their heterosexuality. Oftentimes, they completely and totally reject masculinity and go to a, heter a homosexual relationship, and even then, they almost always play the submissive role. Now, the flip side of the domineering mother coin is that the man becomes very hostile and overly aggressive towards women, wishing to dominate women in every aspect of life. Such men are the prime examples of this toxic masculinity we hear so much about. These tendencies develop from a very young age through adolescence and into adulthood. And if these men are able to marry, they almost always become abusive husbands, especially to their, their wives and their children. These mannerisms can vary in type and severity from verbal abuse to violent physical abuse. The abusive traits typically show themselves as soon as the man perceives that his wife is trying to control him in any way. He believes that his masculinity is dependent on being free and totally out of her control. While there are certainly exceptions to these situations because every case is different, what I'm pointing out here is that an absent father creates a masculine vacuum in his son's life. And that son may view masculinity very differently than a son raised in a tr traditional household. In Raising a Modern Day Night, Robert Lewis presents his encounters with many different men in many different situations. And he places them into one of two groups. One, the overly feminized man. And two, the overly domineering man. He speaks with authority because in his career as a pastor and counselor, he has encountered many sons and fathers struggling on their on their uh, on their path to true masculinity. Each of these two types of men are most certainly toxic, but the real problem does not lie in masculinity, but in the absence of masculinity. Invisible dads are a symptom of this lost masculinity. Now that we have described what toxic masculinity supposedly looks like, let me describe what true masculinity is. True masculinity is far from the examples I've previously mentioned. True masculinity is strong and courageous honorable and honest, respectful and loving without being arrogant or rude to those weaker than them. A man is someone who's willing to put his life on the line for the ones he loves. This character is said in John 15, 13, when Jesus says, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. A man is one who accepts responsibility for his actions, no matter the consequences. He is one who does not shy away from life's difficulties, but instead he takes them head on. Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th president of the United States and true manly man puts it this way. We need the iron qualities that go with true manhood. We need the virtues of resolution, of courage, of indomitable will, of power to do without shirking the rough work that must always be done. Learning about Teddy Roosevelt in our American history class has provided me and I assume many other men a great example of what true traditional masculinity looks like. Teddy was certainly not a toxic male. Instead, he was a man's man in his own time and a good model of true traditional masculinity. The modern feminist movement would say that historically, men have oppressed women and that alone proves that masculinity is toxic. While there is some truth to this, I'll admit, to believe it in its entirety would be to completely go against all basic human biology and psychology. People like to believe that men and women are exactly the same and should do the exact same type of things, but this could not be farther from the truth. The fact of the matter is that with the progression of time and technology, women have become increasingly less dependent on men for their everyday needs. 300 years ago, the family could not survive without a father figure to hunt, build, and provide for them. Nowadays, a father can be replaced with a supermarket and a credit card. 
Since the need for fathers is not as apparent as it once was, some believe there's no real need at all. This is a dangerous idea. Because without fathers filling their natural role in the household, we will end up with many, many more men than I have previously discussed. Either feminized, domineering, and quite possibly many more invisible dads. This trend is explained by Norwegian psychologist Bjorn Andreas Bull Hansen. He is a novelist who has much experience dealing with the effects of feminism in his home country of Norway. He shares many experiences and trends that are developing in Scandinavia that also apply in the United States. Bull Hansen oftentimes laments the progression of the modern day city where the classical roles of men are almost wholly absent. As Christians, we must wholly reject this line of thinking because it goes completely against God's initial will for us. Ephesians 22 through 28 says, Wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives also to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with the water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. The husband and the wife are to love each other unconditionally. And even though the husband is to rule over his wife in the household, he is to love her, respect her, and treat her as if she is an extension of himself. This means being willing to communicate and solve problems together without it being confrontational. The husband must understand that his wife has beliefs and opinions that may very well be contradictory to his own. But she has every right to have them as he does. And that without her, there could be no family for him to lead. Likewise, the wife must understand that while she needs to speak her mind, sometimes she needs to take a step back and let her husband lead the household. A relationship like this both acknowledges and celebrates the natural roles of men and women as complementary and not contradictory. The Bible is very clear on this, and so as followers of Jesus Christ, we must reject the secular idea that men and women are the same in every aspect. The idea of toxic masculinity stems from the misguided belief that men and women, uh, that men are naturally predisposed to be violent and overly dominant towards women. This is plainly not true. Men and women were created differently to fill different roles, but these are complementary roles, not opposing sides for one to triumph over the other. Both genders are equally made in the image of God, and to believe that one is inherently superior than the other is to go completely against biblical teaching. When a man is acting like a man should, and a woman is acting like a woman should, both based on biblical teaching, great things can happen. Bjorn Bolhansen writes about Vikings, handicrafts, and mythology, but he says this about masculinity. Being masculine is not destructive. It's constructive. It's a very positive force. It's about caring. It's about self-sacrifice. It's about love. It's about living in a way so that you are remembered as a good man. That is what a masculine man truly wants. Conversely, if a man is acting like a woman and a woman is acting like a man, trouble is bound to ensue. The idea of toxic masculinity is not masculinity at all. It is the lack thereof that is toxic. If we too are in, to endure as a culture, we must cast aside this foolish idea that men and women that men are inherently evil and understand and value our differences as men and women, not pretend like they don't exist. Masculinity is not toxic. Its deficiency is. Thank you.
All right. Well, thank you, Nick, and uh, well done. Um, before I jump into the questions, I just kind of want to start off with saying that, you know, I've really appreciated having you in American history this year as my senior assistant. Um, you know, it's just, it's really fun for me to see and really exciting for me to see the, the passion and energy that you have for history. And I know that I'm not the only one that, that has seen it in that class, but I know all the, all the juniors that were in there saw it as well. And, you know, I, I know that all of them really enjoyed having you in there and you just really brought uh, a really fun life to that class. So I wanted to say thank you to you for that. Um, to, to begin with, let's just, let's just start off with what are your plans um, post high school graduation? Uh, the plan is to go to uh, Texas A&M University and enlist in the Corps Cadets. Okay, awesome. That's exciting. What uh, which which um oh, I don't know the right word for it. which unit. I think which unit are you going to be a part? Outfit. Of? Outfit. And I'm hoping sorry. for Squadron Seventeen. Thank okay, you. awesome. Yeah, sorry. Outfit. I've got to get the lingo right. So awesome. Well. Um, I'm sure that you're going to do great there and I wish you the best of luck you. as you move forward with that, that exciting process. To start off with, um, why did you decide to write on this topic? Why, why toxic masculinity? Well, throughout my high school career, it's been weighing on my heart seeing the country go into this new direction that we've never seen before of men being evil men are the villains now for some reason uh and i mean i've always been raised to believe men and women are equal in everything and so it's like what's going on why are men the bad guys um i mean i took inspiration from mr sparks and my father two really really good men that have been just very influential on my life and i just keep seeing this trend of just people being angry at men and my generation we had nothing to do with any of the past oppressions that men have committed and so it, it's just been really weighing on my heart this this topic i'm very passionate about it okay so what what started all of that like you know you it's you have the the question that lingers in your mind of you know why why are men suddenly the bad guys Who's, who's primarily responsible for that? Where is that coming from? Well, there, I believe it stems from the early 20th century, basically, when, you know, the women's suffrage and, and all that. And while those movements were very good, and I totally agree, women should have rights to vote and everything, but I believe that that kind of started a shift between these men have oppressed us, which may be very well true, to now we need to fight and fight and fight them to be equal to them. And so that, that idea that this is a fight against them creates kind of this idea of a war between the genders. So okay. I think that's where it stems. So how do, we, how do we find some sort of a resolution between this war between the genders? I think this kind of comes off from Cass's world about objective truth. Objective truth doesn't really, like, it's foreign now. I mean, we need to go back to objective truth because used to be a man is objectively a man and a woman is objectively a woman and they have their gender roles. But now women can be men and men can be women. And so that creates problems, as you can see. And so these men are being raised without masculine fathers and so they're becoming more feminized and that's not to say effeminate effeminate is nothing you can control but feminized is a man is acting like a woman would be okay so an effeminate quality is something that is just you know a man can naturally be effeminate mm -hmm. but yeah. feminized then is where a man is making a choice to act like a woman is that basically yeah okay all right um kind of switching gears a little bit. If you could sum up what manhood is, what a man is in five traits, what would those traits be? 
Hmm. Courageous, honest, loving, sacrificial. Let's see. Let's get another good one. Uh, honorable. Okay. Why? Why would you say that those traits are intrinsically more important for men to have than women? I think all those traits lend themselves to be a very good father figure. And while women most certainly have those traits, there it's a difference between having masculine traits and being masculine. So mm -hmm. I think women can very well have those traits and a lot of women do. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, masculine, the masculine gender can use them very effectively in their role as, as fathers and leaders. Okay. Okay. So, um, who's, who's a person, who's a man, not a person, Who's a man other than your own father that you really look up to and look to for um, this, for inspiration on what it is to be a man? Well, I interviewed Mr. Sparks and Mr. Sparks has been an amazing impact on my life. Uh, I believe about, uh, I think fall semester last year, I invited myself to Mr. Sparks' uh, men's Bible study. So uh, during uh, Monday lunch that we could go and watch a lecture from the very author of my book, Robert Lewis, uh, about what it means to be a true biblical-based man. And so that kind of took this emotion that I already had, feeling for this cause, and just skyrocketed, basically. It's like, I mean, and the lecture was made in, I believe, the early 2000s, and it still applies today, if not so more. And so Mr. Sparks has been an amazing impact on my life. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, you know, Mr. Sparks, I, I was a, a fellow student with his oldest son, Gray. And so I would also say that Mr. Sparks, you know, has definitely been an admiration and a, you know, a manly role model for myself as well. So I think that's a, that's an awesome choice. Um, in your, in your thesis, you mention things like hunting, fishing, and hiking as conventionally manly things. All right. Why would you say that those are conventionally manly things? Well, back before we had HEB and Walmart, I mean, hunting and fishing, that's how you got your food, you know, uh -huh. farming. And then the, that, that charge always landed on the man because the woman, the, the mom, her divine, divine duty is to raise kids and be their teacher. A mom is their child's first teacher. Mm -hmm. And so she has her hands full of leading like, like, working with this household and making sure everything sails smoothly that the man needs to be able to put food on the table he needs to be the bread the breadwinner and so that's why i believe that those are the naturally more masculine traits okay so you mentioned kind of the the mother's role in in all of that as far as you know the the homemaker and the you know raising children and um really nurturing them and being their first teacher it almost feels like in our society and in our culture that that's almost become like there's a negative connotation attached to that, right? <laughs> As if like that's somehow uh, less important or inferior uh, things to do. Why, why is that? Mm -hmm. Why is there, you know, why is a negative connotation been attached to those things? I believe that stems from this idea that we need to be just like men. If a woman is the exact same as a man, and so she should have the exact same job, do the exact same types of things. And I have no problem with a mother working as well, but if she takes on the responsibility of motherhood, it should be the first thing in her mind was, I need to love these kids. I need to raise these kids. I need to teach these kids to be good people. Mm -hmm. And now I believe that this idea that, oh, you're just, you're just a stay-at-home mom. You know, you don't actually make money you don't do anything that is the complete and total opposite of the truth i believe that in many cases the mom's job is harder than a man going out and having you know working in the oil field or, or just making money mm -hmm. okay great um with the you know going going back to the the hunting fishing hiking um what if what if a man doesn't you know, enjoy any of those activities, does that make, you know, that man less of a man and that he doesn't, you know, like doing those things? I've thought about this a lot, actually, because, I mean, you have people who 
live in big cities, people who've lived in big cities their entire life can't even get out of them. And so they don't have the, the opportunity to go hunting and fishing and those other, like I said, conventionally masculine things. But that does not detract from the virtues that they can embody in their life by how they raise their family and live throughout you know, their individual city and how they're known to be virtuous or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it along to Mrs. Jackson. Gig em, Nick. Yes, ma'am. Gig em. Uh, I'm excited. Um, as, as a fellow Aggie, fellow core member, uh, I want to kind of go down that road a little bit. But before I go there, tell me what one aspect of Aggie life you're most looking forward to next year? I got to say, I'm looking forward to the challenge of the Corps Cadets. I mean, I have been, I've been, you know, heavier set, overweight my entire life, and that's been a, a struggle for me. But recently, you know, I've been always raised like, you know, gig them, you know, Corps Cadets. And I was like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily have to do that. But as I've got to visit and do more of that, it's like, man, this is – this is kind of like a, a furnace. You go in there and like you, uh, you, you test yourself, basically. You test what you're made of. And that's just something I'm really excited for. And so like recently I've been training really hard and trying to like Levi. Levi's my inspiration. He's my man. He's basically my personal trainer. I love the guy to death. I, I wouldn't be where I am without him. So it, it's really the challenge of the core that I'm most looking forward to. Cool. I'm really excited for you for that. Those were the glory days for sure. Um, so in regards to your topic on to toxic masculinity, tell me about masculinity and femininity in the core or in the military in general. Definitely. Um, I think uh, that women have their place in the military too, but the idea that men and women are inherently equal in everything uh, kind of dilutes that because it's like, okay, are women as suited as men are to be, you know, trench warfare fighting like bloody battles or are they, I mean, it's been proven. I, I know the Israelis did a study that women are actually better pilots. They're better snipers. And so, but this idea that the ones they're naturally predisposed to aren't good enough, that they should do the exact same type of things. And so that's kind of led to this idea that there either needs to be two different standards for men and women. And I don't know if I agree with that. I think there should be one uniform standard. And if the woman can reach that and outperform, man, she deserves that seat every bit. But if, if she can't, maybe there are better roles that she's naturally predisposed to do than, uh, than a man would even be and that she would fit in more comfortably there. How do you think the feminist movement historically has impacted the core and the military? Well, obviously integration. Um, there is, I mean, that started in the, I believe the seventies. I, I, I'm kind of stupid, so I don't know the exact date, but um, that started, I, I agree with it, but it kind of started downhill spiral to where like, okay, if, you know, women can be in the core, then we can do this in the core, you know, you know, they have to be in the same outfits, they have to do everything like that. And so that kind of rolls itself into like very progressive ideals where it's like, you know, oftentimes like women are chosen like over men for certain roles because they are women, which I don't necessarily agree with. And, uh, you know, yeah, sorry. I'm kind of okay. scatterbrained right now. No, that, that actually leads me into another question I, I wanted to talk to you about. How, um, how do equality and difference fit together? So you talked about that a little bit in your, in your paper. But what does that really look like? So you said that men and women are equal, but they're different. So can you elaborate on that for a little bit? Definitely. I think the uh, the differences between men and women, see, I think my father brought this out to me while I was doing my oral, that there's a difference between being a good man and being a good woman and being a good person. 
being a good person is, you know, having baseline morality and stuff like that. But when you become, when you're a man or a woman, you have those individual virtues and characteristics that you can, you know, apply to your life. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, can you repeat the question? I'm so sorry. Yeah. So you were, you were headed in the, in a good direction. I was asking you how equality mm. or being different fit together. Yeah. So being a person, you have your, your certain unalienable rights and stuff like that. That is true for everyone. But uh, being, it's not a separate but equal situation at all. It's just, we need to, as a culture, understand that it's, Biolo it's a biological fact that we're different. And that's not a bad thing in any way, that men have things that are better suited to than women do, and women have things that are better suited than men are. You know, it's, it's like, again, it's just, it, it butts heads with this idea that we're the same in every aspect. And that's just, you don't really, like, you can't see that. Men and women aren't the same biologically, psychologically, you know, even sometimes spiritually, they're just different. They think differently. And so, yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to pass it along to Mr. Blackburn now. Hey there, Nick. Uh, this is sure your wheelhouse, uh, having a panel discussion like this. You are such a man's man. It's been good to know you. Thank you. Hey, uh, I want to focus in on the, the topic of submission. Uh, you read out of Ephesians 5, where wives are to submit to the husbands and and the verse right before the passage you read, Ephesians 5.21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Mm -hmm. And so this word submission, um, just, uh, you know, what's it mean? What's biblical submission? Uh, how is it the same or different from uh, the concept of submission that's used like in, it's WWE night, it's time for the Terminator to beat his opponent into submission. Or um, you think of uh, all the different kind of wars where one country goes in and conquers another country and uh, makes all the other people there be in submission to them. Mm -hmm. Or uh, maybe just in training or breaking a horse that uh, you're trying to make that horse submit to the will of, of the rider. Or a coach with a team that the, the players are submitting to the, to the coach. Uh, can, can you talk, talk about submission and what's biblical submission? Uh, definitely. I believe there, in those examples, there's kind of two different meanings. You know, you have this submission of the world, which is I'm forcing you to do something. This is against your will because I won. But this submission, biblical sense, I believe, is willing. I believe that you are submitting to God, not because you have to, not because he's beaten you, but because you love him and you want to. Same thing because to a wife and a husband. They submit to each other because they love and care for each other, not because they've been beaten in some kind of way. Yeah, that's good. So it's already been mentioned that you know, men and women have equal worth in the eyes of God, their creator. So uh, are women inferior to men? No. Um, okay. So how can a woman submit to their husband if they're inferior? Or I'm sorry, if they're not inferior? I think equals can submit to equals when they're trying to achieve a common cause. It's like I might be in a group project with my peers, but we might elect a leader. And out of our own free will, we decide that we are all going to submit to this leader so we can get what we need to get done efficiently. Okay, so you said that uh, the wife needs to be able to step back at some point and, and let the, the husband lead. Uh, when would be a time that she should not? Well, like I said before, the mom is the first teacher in the, in the household. It's the first person your child really gets to know. Uh, and so moms are way better at rearing young, young children, infants. And so they have that gift. And so they can be the loving and nurturing that they need throughout early, early age. And so if a man tries to step in and tries to take over her natural role, she needs to say, no, this is my job. I'm better at it than you are. And this is my place. 
Okay, that's great. I think it's time to get some of the questions from uh, all your audience. They wanna hear what you say. All right, so this, this question comes from Casey Miller, one of your juniors in American history. And she says, I feel like media, mostly kids' cartoons, often portray dads as either the punchline to every joke or a dad who is constantly at work. How do you think this form of comedy has affected society? Well, that's a very, very good question because I almost used that as my, in my oral, I almost said, when was the last time you saw a father who wasn't an idiot? Um, I think that this is showing kids at a very young age that their dad, their dad's not nearly as smart as their mom. They don't nearly care about you as much as your mom does. And so that can really affect, especially now, and even when I was growing up, you know, five years ago or whatever, that their, their dads aren't as important to them as their moms are. And that they're not, they don't love them equally. It's that the father loves his job more than his kids, or he's just an idiot and stuff like that. And your mom is the smart, wise one. Your mom's the one who really matters to you. Okay, awesome. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and get another question. All right, from Caden Corzine. How can the turn from strong leadership to domineering happen? Okay. I think uh, domineering is basically you're trying to own the person. You're trying to force bend them to your will, basically. You're trying to force them to be what you want to be. But strong leadership is a relationship. It is I'm the leader. And you are not necessarily the servant, but you are under me. And you respect me, I respect you, and you follow me, even when you might not always agree. But that overarching respect for your leader is what makes leadership work. If you're a leader who has no respect, you're a boss. And people only listen to you because they have to. Hmm. Okay, that's good. All right, this next one comes from Reagan Harper. In the Chronicles of Narnia, Lucy asks if Aslan is safe. Mr. Beaver replies, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. How does this relate to true masculinity? Hmm. He isn't safe, he's good. Hmm. Well, I believe that naturally, and the way it should be, the man is kind of the first line of defense for his family or his friends, and so that he would willingly put himself into harm's way or into danger to protect the ones he loves. Like I said, uh, it ties into John 15, 13, you know, greater love hath no man than this. Uh, and so when safety is not guaranteed when you become a father, I'll say that. Uh, oftentimes you'll have to put yourself between an adversary and your, your loved ones. And so you can be well doing like he, he's not safe but he's good so he's in the line of fire but he's still there i guess okay good thank you all right this one comes from lucas lacy who would you say is the most masculine member of the senior class Ooh. oh man they're all so so masculine Let's see. I have to think about this one. Okay, I'm gonna pick three. I'm gonna pick three. I got Grant Sparks, Grant Barrage, and Levi Hoffman. All right. Well, thank you for that for a second. There. Not that I don't think the other ones are not masculine. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> All right. I think we have one more question coming. So this is from Leah Beatty. What was your favorite part about being Brock in junior plays? And would you say he was masculine in a toxic way? Um, my favorite part about being Brock was, of course, screaming at Leah, who was Kelly. Um, that was that was great. My voice didn't like it so much, but uh, it was fun. But uh, I would say that Brock is definitely a toxic person. Um, he displays traits that are just 
completely and totally against what a good man would do. And I think that was what we were going for. We were trying to make the most, you know, rude, jerky, like domineering. I mean, Brock was very dominant towards Kelly. He just basically made her do whatever he wanted. So, yeah, he's definitely a toxic person. Okay. Well, I'd like to, before moving on with the the rest of my questions, I'd like to thank the audience members for um, being here for Nick's Oral and for contributing their questions to it. Okay, so this is kind of, you know, it's funny that uh, Casey mentioned her questions about um, kind of how father figures are oftentimes portrayed in uh, TV shows nowadays. And in your... In your paper, you describe this idea of invisible dads who are busy, rushed, but they're full of good intentions, right? But at the same time, you know, as I think about it, at the end of the day, the family has to be provided for. So what about the fathers who would seem to fit this description? You know, they're always away from home. They're always at work. It seems like they care, you know, most about work, but... In reality, those fathers, you know, not all of them, but some of those fathers, it seems like they haven't got the time, you know, to be home as much as they wish they could because they're so busy just trying to make ends meet for their family. Mm -hmm. So where do they fall in all of this? Well, like I said, they can definitely be invisible dads, but they have to take take a look from another person's perspective. Go, Go into the third person view and say, well, I was only at home, you know, you know, 10 hours this week and I was just asleep. I didn't see my kids at all. And so they need to realize what their situation is and they need to prioritize what's really important to them. And for some men, that may, may very well be their job. Their mm-hmm. job might be more important to them than their family. And that's, I think that's why we have such a high divorce rate in, in this world because some people do and quite often prioritize money over their family. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think, making the intentional effort to say, you know what, I'm tired, I'm, I'm dragging butt, I just got off of a 12-hour shift, but I'm still going to go talk to my kids for 30 minutes, tuck them in, and you know, say goodnight, because I love them, and I want them to know that I care about them. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily have to be this, this you know, for some of those fathers in that position, this you know, spending an overwhelming amount of times with their kids, but just being intentional when when they do have some moments of time being intentional about trying to spend that mm-hmm. with their children, even if it's not much. Is yes, that... definitely. The thing about invisible dads is they have an abundance of time sometimes and they just don't care. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. So on this, you know, the same topic of invisible dads, you say, you know, you describe invisible dads is having an irrational fear of angering their wife. I'm not quite so sure that that's an irrational fear. You know, why do you describe it in that way? Well, I mean, there's a rational fear of, you know, marital, you know, uh, conflict. Um, Mm -hmm. But uh, it becomes irrational to the point where you believe that the consequences will be so drastic and severe that you refuse to interact with her basically you know beyond the oh love you honey you know i'm gonna go watch football please don't yell at me you know uh because i mean it's inevitable every relationship will have conflict but and you might do your very best to avoid it but it becomes irrational when you will do anything to avoid you know speaking your mind that might even cause a little bit of a spat okay all right. Awesome. Well, once again, before I before I hand it on to Mrs. Jackson and Mr. Blackburn, I'd like to congratulate you on uh, your senior thesis. And, you know, thank you for all the time and energy that you put into senior assisting my American history class this year. So. It was a blast. OK, Nick, surprise. We have a question from your sister. Hello, and Alex. <laughs> In some people's opinion, one role of a woman in a household is to tame the savages that are the men, bringing order to the chaos, in other words. How do you relate this type of a relationship to your definitions of men and women's roles in a relationship? 
Well, that's a very good question, Alex. Uh, yeah, definitely men are, are developing boys, especially as they're going through their terrible twos and everything are very rambunctious. Uh, I know I was. And so the mother's first role as their, their first teacher is to teach them how to be responsible and, you know, respectful to not only their parents, but to their parents' things and everything. And so in that aspect, taming the savages is very, very uh, accurate. Um, but also when uh, it becomes maybe later in life, seven, eight, nine, ten, the boy is developing into an adolescent or developing from adolescent to, to a full man, the, father, the, the mother can say, hey, stop that, stop that, stop that. And they might not listen to her. That's when the father needs to come and instill, you know, the, you know put the fear of God in, in the kid. And, you know, because, you know, the mother is naturally supposed to be more loving and merciful because, you know, that really helps them as they're raising an infant. But the father, I, I will say, men tend to be a little, a little colder when dealing with, uh, with kids uh, that have been disobedient. And so I think that might be where taming the savages can be both kind of men and women, but mainly the mom. Okay, great minds think alike, because Alex has given me the perfect segue into another set of questions I had lined up for you. Um, you talked about some of the ways that boys, young men are emasculated through this whole process. What are some less obvious ways maybe that society is doing that in boys, little boys, school-aged boys, teenagers? Well, I think, I think there is one, there is this overwhelming idea that, you know, men aren't always as good at, you know, things than women are like, like school and stuff like that. Men, men aren't as nice, you know, men are just constantly being bombarded with, you know, you're okay, you're just not as good. And so that's kind of a subtle way to tell them that women are better than you. So you need to just, you know, listen to the women in your life because they know what's best. Okay. Um, and then from there, I'm going to backtrack a little bit um, to something else that was inherent in Alex's question. So tell me, if you will, um, from a biblical perspective, what is the role of the husband, characteristic-wise, personality-wise, and what is the role of the wife? I think, uh, as I've said before in my paper, the role of the wife is to be the homemaker. She needs to be like the loving nurturer that the, the family desperately needs. She needs to raise the kids. She's their first teacher. Uh, and so she can, you know, enjoy the, the fruits of her labor later in life after all that hard work is done, you know, raising them. But the father, the father first is the protector of the family. He is the, he is what stands between his family and evil. And, you know, uh, so he, like I said, needs to be willing to put his life on the line for somebody else and that's something i'd seriously ask someone if they're saying oh i want to be a dad or i want to get married Just, are you willing to die for that person do you love them that much uh and so his first role would be the protector and then all the other roles you know disciplinarian breadwinner would fall under that because he's doing his best to protect his family from starvation from from dangers and, and you know other other things Okay, and so how do the roles of the husband and the wife then um, fit together to make marriage a picture for the world of who God is? Hmm. Well, I think one way you can tell a marriage has really, really worked is by the fruits of their labor, which is their children. If their children have been raised and you know and they're very godly and they're very obedient uh typically because every case is different that will reflect well on their parents uh and but there are some cases of course where the kids will not be taught and that's just their own individual personality or the kid will naturally be obedient and their parents might not even be all that great but that will be the, the one of the best ways to identify that this family 
is living in biblical teaching, raising their son or daughter well, uh, and, you know, teaching them what is, you know, uh, what was it, uh, true, beautiful, and just. Okay. All right. I am going to pass it along to Mr. Blackburn so he can get one last round in. Thank you. Nick, uh, with that line of questioning that Mrs. Jackson's just using, it made me think of something I read recently. And, um, you know, this whole marriage relationship thing that the, the Bible talks about, it, that uh, it's a picture of uh, Christ in the church, that uh, that same kind of relationship and that we submit to Christ. And uh, it really described the husband as being the leader. I, I like the way you've been talking about that. And it really emphasizes the love idea that you've been uh, mentioning several times that he leads not as a master over a servant, but as a lover uh, leading his beloved. And uh, when we keep that straight, I think it uh, keeps it uh, lined up with what the Bible's teaching about submission. Uh, I'd like to just finish up with uh, you thinking about uh, these boys, young boys, or, and you know, sometimes they've gotten quite old before and they haven't learned masculinity. If they have that invisible father or the absent father, uh, what are some ways that they can um, understand masculinity um yeah definitely that's very relevant today because you know we have this this uh plague of just absent fathers and you know the the father wounds that are created because of the lack of masculine roles in the home so a way that could happen is the son very rarely could intentionally be like understand his situation and seek out uh, another a man, male role model, particularly someone older than him, maybe an uncle or a, a friend's a friend's dad, or something like that. But also, if the son hasn't really fully understood the importance of a masculine role model, then it could lie on the mother being, you know, really putting that positive force and in, force into his life, like saying, "Hey, you know, talking to her brother, hey, I love you. I need someone to help raise my child," you know. And so I need I need something to to be positive in his life, showing that showing what true masculinity looks like. Or I mean that could even be a teacher. Uh, and so, but either someone needs to implant this positive masculine force, or uh, it needs to be uh, discovered for themselves. Yeah, maybe places like a, a youth pastor, uh, a scout leader, a coach. Definitely. All those could be ones that uh, would, could provide some uh, masculine leadership for them, speaking into their life, uh, giving them examples of what it looks like in flesh. So I'm wondering, as you as an RT leader in the last two years, did you feel like that uh, you tried to be a, a, an example of a masculinity with uh, the RT group? And if so, can you give us an example? I've, I've tried. Uh, I mean, I, I am, of course, imperfect. You know, I'm still on my journey. Um, you know, so I, I, of course, have failed and I've fallen, um, but I've done my best to be an example to these men of how they should act, especially through these high school years, um, really, uh, I mean, being re like responsible for their own actions. And a big thing that I've tried to instill both in my RT group and in my robotics club is that when things go bad, it does no use to get mad about it. You know, it's... You know, we went to uh, we went to a robotics competition this year, and we lost. We got like almost last place, and then everyone else was kind of down. I was like, you know what? You did your best. You you really put yourself out there, and there's nothing you can do better than your best. And so what you can do is you can get mad about it, and you can suffer because of your anger, or you can learn from it, and you can you know get over it and grow as a man. That's good. That reminds me of the uh, Teddy Roosevelt quote that you shared about having that indomitable will. Uh, you, don't, you don't let uh, the scoreboard or anything like that define you. Uh, you continue to um, stand up and, and, and be counted even if it didn't happen the way you wanted it to. That's great. So I think it's your turn, Nick. All right. Um, so I'll go to you first, Mr. Blackburn. Um, so uh, you've moved here rather recently, uh, I mean, a, a year or two. Uh, and so I was wondering, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? And what house would you have if you could build anything, you know? 
no limits. Well, Nick, there's nothing better than family. I'd be right here. Uh, you know, I'm getting tears in my eyes just thinking about it. That the hundreds of ways in the last two years of uh, being being around my grandkids and daughter and son-in-law, uh, there's just mm -hmm. it's just nothing better unless I could get my uh, other son and his family to to be in the same spot. So that'd probably be the house. It's a really cool house. You know, it'd probably have uh, one of these curly Q slippery slides down the middle of the house <laughs> and a uh, big old uh, mosh pit, you know, j balls that you could jump in and throw them and throw them in the baskets and trampolines all over, you know, like a trampoline park kind of place inside your house, uh, all padded so you wouldn't get hurt too bad. And, um, and then everybody living in the same place, but I, I'd be able to be on the way on the end so I could get off to where it's quiet so I could get some rest, you know, <laughs> to, you know, it, it does awfully get tiring, you know, around those uh, young kids. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. The building's the house, the family's the home. Uh, so Mrs. Jackson, uh, so as a fellow future Aggie, I'll be on my way there this fall. I wanted to know what is your funniest, most embarrassing story from your time at A&M? Okay. Yeah. I was thinking about this earlier today when I was thinking about you, because I don't think I've ever shared this story with you. Uh, when I joined the Corps, I went out on the training ship that A&M has from A&M Galveston and spent the summer on that training ship. And that year we crossed the equator, which is not something that happens a lot. And so they do an initiation when you cross the equator. And part of that initiation was we had to stick our heads in a toilet full of green water. So, yeah, that was fun. That sounds like a hoot and a half, if you ask me. Oh, yeah, it was great. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, finally, Mr. Nelson. So, you know, my mind wanders as, as it does, you know, in history class sometimes, you know. And this, this virus, you know, you know, some people are talking about the end of days, you know, the apocalypse, the, the boogaloo, you know, the, the, uh, the end of life as we know it. So... If you could pick three people from our American history class to be your apocalypse survival team, who would it be and why? Oh, man. What a question. Um, I would... I would have to say Alexander, Jake, and Casey, because the perpetual arguments and bickering would be a constant source of entertainment for me. Yep. <laughs> uh, and if, if they're loud, you can always just, you know, le leave them to distract the, uh, the, the zombies or whatever it is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. So, all right, Nick. Well, congratulations on reaching this point. And, uh, you know, this, this awesome milestone and this achievement here at MCA. Um, as we close, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Blackburn to go ahead and close us in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you. Thank you, God, for Nick and for this opportunity he has to uh, just think deeply about a thought and, and an idea and to communicate it. Lord, just what a pinnacle event this is for he and his classmates. Lord, we pray for he and uh, the other seniors of 2020 that they uh, have a great bonding time through this uh, oral week. Just thank you for the way they've all been uh, listening to each other and using their ideas as they've had their discussions. Just uh, thank you for the growth that's happening in our school body through this. Uh, bless Nick. Prepare him, Lord, for the what lies ahead and help him to always to be a man that's after a God's own heart. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Way to go, Nick. Awesome job, Nick. <laughs>